what do you look at when you drive to work every morning? If you're like me, I'm looking at the blue sea, the green hillsides, the white sandy beaches. Or do you just take it for granted that that view will always look like that? Small islands are very unique ecosystems, different to large land masses. Everything is connected and everything has a role to play. From the tops of the hillsides to the valleys and the guts, to the coasts with the mangroves and the salt ponds, each part is connected. They're like pieces of a puzzle. Over the last years, I've had the pleasure of working in protected area conservation in the British Virgin Islands. I want to share with you today some of the stories of conservation and the environment. This view is from the top of Great Thatch. How many times have you sat on a ferry going to St. Thomas and run right past this island? Have you ever looked and wondered, what's at the top of that hill? I'm very happy to say I've been to the top of that hill and it's probably not going to happen again because it was a very steep climb. But it's amazing. Sometimes you have to get out in nature to look at it from a different perspective. This is a view looking east of the BVI. If you're not out in nature, how can you appreciate it? We have so much endemic and endangered flora and fauna in the BVI. This is an orchid, Cycilles macanelli. It's found in abundance on Anagata and elsewhere in the BVI. But sometimes things that are found in abundance can be very simply and quickly cleared with the backhoe. This is actually a Puerto Rico bank endemic. That means it's only found in Puerto Rico, the US and British Virgin Islands. So whilst we have it in abundance, globally, it's very rare. This one is even rarer, Croton fish lockii. Only known on Tortola and Virgin Gorda. In fact, the population on Tortola we only discovered last year, previously only had seen before in the 1970s. So we were extremely excited. It's one of the privileges I feel in my job, that every day you don't know what you're going to discover, you don't know what you're going to find. Something new to science, something rediscovered. But the population on Virgin Gorda is only protected in a very small area on Gorda Peak National Park. Most of these are on private property. So some of the things that we do is we map the location of endangered plants and animals using GPS, and then we put it in GIS, Geographic Information Systems. We create digital maps that we can overlay with different things like roads and land parcels and ownership so we can understand more about where these endangered plants and animals are. Whilst we're out in the wild, we come across scenes like this. An invasive beetle has been attacking the century plant, agave mishnam. Many of you might be familiar with this. It's used for Christmas trees. But you don't see them flowering so much anymore. This photo was taken at Great Tobago National Park. There's no people living there. Nobody really goes there, apart from us when we're doing research on the frigate birds. But yet that beetle is on Great Tobago, and it's killing all of the agave. I was there twice this week, and we were actually mapping the location of these agave. And there's nothing we can do. You can't take away the beetle. You can't stop it spreading. All we can do is collect seeds from the plants and try to grow them so that they're not lost. This is a view from the top of Leverick Bay at North Sound, Virgin Gorda. We were there that day collecting seeds and plant specimens because a lot more of my work now I do is working with the Town and Country Planning Department and other agencies to try and be a part of the development control process to try and understand, well, we can't save everything, but maybe if we're part of the, the dialogue with landowners, we can help them understand what's even there. Do you know what plants are on your property? Probably not. So more and more we find people coming to us saying, please come to our land, come and have a look and tell us if we've got endangered plants and animals. Be proud, you might have a very rare species on your property. There was a parcel of land that we were there that day. There were like three endemic species. Endemic means found nowhere else in the world on a very smart piece of land. I took a photo and it had three rare species. To me, it's like so exciting, but so sad. Like the name of my talk, conserving the environment is like peeling an onion. You have to keep peeling back the layers to realize that there's so much more than just having protected areas. The way we develop here in the BVI, people like to see their land. They clear cut their property before they build. We have often many times scenes like this. Dirt roads, not paved, and hillsides left bare. 
But to the landowner, it's actually much more costly because you end up putting in retaining walls to hold up these, these, these hillsides that the tree roots have been naturally doing it for you for free. And this is what happens when it rains. This is a picture from the north shore of Tortola after a heavy rainstorm. All the dirt from those unpaved roads coming right down into the sea on the coral reef, smothering them. We need to have better planning, joined up dialogues between landowners, so that instead of all the zigzag roads going across our hillsides, maybe we had one. Doesn't that make sense? But the way that land ownership is here in the BVI, you might have a whole family of 20 people owning one parcel of land, and everybody's not talking to everybody else, let alone their neighbor. But this is the solutions we need to get to. Sea Cows Bay, the mangroves. Mangroves used to be in all the sheltered bays across the BVI. But in small islands, it's a competition for land area. And the coasts are always the first places to go for marinas, reclamation. How do we prevent all of these mangroves being lost? Conservation is all about finding solutions. It's all about partnerships. This is a very successful mangrove replanting project that we've been doing here in the BVI since 1999. It's very simple. It uses a PVC pipe with a slit down the side, and you just bang it into the substrate, and then you put a red mangrove seedling into it. It's very low maintenance. We try and do this with civic groups, students, members of a community. Get people involved so you feel if you planted something, maybe you'll help protect it. You have ownership over it. We have a critically endangered rock iguana upon Anagata, Cycloropingus. It makes me sad sometimes to think that more people have been to Florida than they've been to Anagata. I'm actually going to ask, put your hand up if you've been to Anagata. Well, I'm happy to see that's very good. But sadly, that's not usually the case. We need to have pride in what we have here. There are less than 500 of these iguanas in the wild. And the Cycloropingus is the basal species of all iguanas, of the Caribbean rock iguanas. That means that the Cyclura species in the Cayman Islands and Jamaica are all evolved from this one. But there's threats from feral cats. You think, why feral cats? Because people who live on Anagata might have pet cats. But if they don't spay and neuter them, they become feral. And now there's a massive cat problem up there. You say, well, why don't they spay and neuter them? Because vets don't regularly go to Anagata. You have to bring your cat to Tortola. Anybody who goes to Anagata knows how hard it is just even on the ferry to get yourself and your shopping, let alone your cat. So we thought, OK, partnerships, conservationists, we need to start taking vets. So just last week, I was on Anagata, and we took two vets, and we did free spay and neuter. And you know, it's just a really simple thing. Like, you have to understand, why do people interact with the environment in the way they do? Are they deliberately doing it? Or is it just that there's other reasons and we have to get to the bottom of that? As I said, it's the layers you have to understand to get to the bottom of it. So also, we were trying to find a way to save the little juvenile iguanas, because that's really when they're at their most um, threatened by the cats. So we have a program where with iguana scientists that we work with, we survey and map the nesting grounds, which are the sandy dunes on Anagata, and we map in GPS their nests, flag them with metal flashing, and then, around the time when they're ready to hatch, we go and catch the little babies, because they're really pretty stupid at that age, and they just stand still, and like just stand there like, oh, come catch me. So, you know, it's very easy to catch them, and we put them in a Head Start facility, and we rear them until they're large enough to be released. So it's usually about 400 grams. So, and then they're safe from predators, which are really snakes and the cats. Not all iguanas are the same. This is the green iguana. Iguana, iguana. Very different to our native rock iguana. The green is when they're in their juvenile form. And as they become older, they're brown. People, I'm sure you've all seen this. And you all probably think they're great, they're cute, lots of people have pets. To us, this is public enemy number one, and we never want to see it on Anagata. We have had a sighting of one, but unfortunately, we had to deal with that. So, what can happen? Why should you care? Is because these breed twice as fast. They lay twice as many eggs, and they can outcompete very fast. That's what means invasive. Why should you care? Because this can happen. This is what happens when green iguanas get out of control. 
Fortunately, this picture was not taken here. This is from Grand Cayman. One of my colleagues over there shared this with me because it's a warning. This is what can happen. They have a problem of 800,000 green iguanas have been recorded before this year's breeding season. They're doing a massive culling of these. They have to kill 1,000 every day, five days a week, if they even want to half the population. Why? Because it's an actually a problem for people doing construction, because they nest in the sand. So they have to sift the sand before constructing. They're uprooting roads, because Cayman Islands is very like Anagata, very sandy. We don't ever want to see this happen here. So a little bit of fear is good. The magnificent frigate bird. I love this picture because I remember the day I was there. It had just rained, they had bad hair day, sticking up everywhere. But it's just amazing. I feel like I'm in a National Geographic every time I go there. It's just beautiful. They're soaring overhead. It's just an amazing experience to be there. And you know, and that's something that I was so happy to be able to share these stories with you because most people will never see these things. And so is it that if you don't see it, you don't care about it? But if you know the story, maybe you'll help. So these frigate birds nest at Great Tobago National Park, but they fly all over the Caribbean. Local scientists here have been GPS tracking their movements, seeing where they go. Because whilst they nest here, they are moving around. So are they our birds, you know? Or are we just the caretakers of these birds in their nesting habitat? We have a responsibility to protect where they're nesting, but they have threats. It's quite traditional here to have goats on a lot of the islands, but goats cause huge erosion. Through many conversations with communities, a lot of people don't understand why we want to get rid of the goats and remove goats from certain islands. They're like, don't you like goats? And I was like, not that I have a personal thing about goats, but they're not found in the wild. They're farm animals that have been introduced and they cause massive erosion. After one heavy rainstorm, we had a landslide come down and knock out the trees of nesting frigate birds and kill the birds. We're actually doing a whole assessment of monitoring the vegetation on this island now to see as the goats become removed, how much the vegetation grows back and the frigate birds population can expand. But another threat to the frigate birds is fishing line. If anybody's ever seen a frigate bird, they're very common over all the bays. So even though they nest at Great Tobago, they're flying all over the BBI. And it's the largest colony in the Eastern Caribbean. But the fishing line is a major threat these birds steal fish from other birds. That's how they get it. They can't land in the water. Their wings can't get wet. So they have to steal fish, either from fishermen or other birds. And a lot of the time, fishermen just cut the line. They don't bring in the bird and unhook it properly. So what happens? The birds fly back to the colony, and they literally hang themselves. So we have to go, my colleagues and I, fellow conservationists, and go cut the fishing line because other birds will still fly into that fishing line back in the colony. Education of fishermen is also one of the things we're trying to do. Educate people, and maybe this don't realize. Maybe I'm naive sometimes, and I, after 20 years, I like to think you can't ever become bitter. Sometimes you have to think people just don't know, and maybe if they knew, they would help. The BVI is more marine environment than it is land. I was really fortunate to be part of a a project, a research project, to survey the marine environment of the BVI. We were looking to try to decide where were the most important places to protect and include in a protected area network. So it's a tough job, but somebody had to do it. Swim around the island, snorkel, you know, see what was there. It was amazing. You know, there are still places you can see elk corn coral, even though there was a massive die-off in the 1980s of the spiny sea urchins, which caused so much algae to grow on coral reefs that a lot of our shallow corals died. There are still places, they are coming back. But there are a lot of threats, you know, not only human threats, but climate change, coral bleaching. All of these things are happening. Do you see it? We're a major marine tourism industry here. We have over 800 charter boats registered in the BVI. And that doesn't include all the boats coming from the US Virgin Islands and all the other private boats just going around the Caribbean. We have a major industry, and that's not just for shipping. We also have mega yachts, we also have barges. That's a lot of boats, and our bays aren't getting any bigger. And one of the major problems is anchoring, anchor damage. You have a lot of inexperienced boat captains 
who just don't know what they're doing. We call them credit card captains. They have the money, but they don't necessarily know what they're doing. Is it our fault for letting them go out there? Should we make them all have crews on board who know where they're going? Because this is the result. Anchors in our coral reef. And it's not just the anchor damage. We've had a lot more ship groundings. A few years ago, a vessel grounded a carrot shoal and dropped 30 tons of lead shot on the reef. There was some cleanup, but you can't clean it all up. Lead shot pellets. It just moving around in the ocean current. And what's, we don't know what the impact will be in the long run. We don't know what the fish eat that. Everybody likes to eat fish here. But you've got to have solutions, like I said. And there's a great example. In the BVI, we've had a wonderful mooring buoy program for marine conservation. Since 1991, the dive operators actually were the first ones who recognized the problem. Their livelihood depended on it. There they were, diving, and they're seeing anchors destroying the same reefs that they're taking these tourists to. So they actually came up with a solution. What should we do? So they came to the authorities, like the national parks. We're going to install mooring buoys, and we'll do it as a partnership. And we now have over 200 mooring buoys in 62 sites around the BVI. But it's still not enough. We have to have legislation to stop anchoring. Because right now, there's no law saying you can't drop your anchor right next to that mooring buoy. But it's a start, and it was a great idea. And they came to us because they realized their, their livelihood depended on the health of that environment. Sea turtles. We have four species of sea turtles here. Leatherback, loggerhead, green, and hawksbill. People love to see a sea turtle when they're out on a boat. There's turtle encounter programs where people can pay and go swim with the turtles and help tag them. And these are wonderful opportunities because actually the tourist is paying for the cost of the materials to tag the turtles. We've had research scientists here for years, for over 20 years, documenting the nesting beaches, understanding what the patterns of the foraging and the nesting of these turtles. All these things, it's important information that we need to know, understand the whole history of turtles. It's an amazing fact to think that a female turtle returned to the same beach in which it laid its egg and which it was born. But sadly, we still allow turtles to be caught here. Hawksbill and green turtles. And there are size restrictions of what you're supposed to catch and not catch. But as the photo shows, sometimes that isn't always enforced. Yes, cultural habits of wanting to eat turtle meat are important to recognize. And we have to understand why people do things. You can't always just come in and say, no, we should stop catching turtles. You have to understand. You have to make people buy into the ideas that's one thing I have absolutely found in all my years now working in conservation, is that you can't make somebody do something. They have to want to do it, and they have to understand why you need to do it. When you see a picture like this, these are conch middens up on Anagata. Makes you wonder if there's any conch left in the sea. There's conch and lobster on nearly every menu in the BVI, but when you look at this picture, are we just focusing on our needs of today and not thinking about tomorrow? The BVI has changed so much from the 1960s to the 1980s. We've had a rapid pace of development. My father actually came here in 1968 with the Royal Engineers to build the airfield at Beef Island. It was Operation Treasure Island. Funnily enough, he stayed after that because he thought it was quite a nice place to live. But the pace of development is accelerating. We need strong environmental legislation to keep a balance. I'm not saying that development shouldn't take place, but we have to have a balance. We have to have limits, or else the environment will lose. Protected areas have a really important role to play. These are the places that are trying to protect the most important habitats, the areas with the rarest species, our landscapes that are the most unique to the BVI that we want to make sure are there for my children, your children, their children, into the future. These are wonderful learning opportunities for students to go out and experience nature. We always say the environment is a wonderful classroom. But unfortunately, I found through a lot of conversations, there's a lot of fear in people when you talk about protected areas. People feel as if you're taking something away from them. And I don't understand that. It's like, this is an opportunity for your future. We're trying to safeguard your future. We're giving you fishing for the future. These habitats, the same 
green hillsides and blue seas, you want to see them tomorrow? And the other curious thing is, over 90% of land in the BVI is privately owned, not protected areas. So we all have a role in conserving the environment. Have you ever seen a child when they're in nature, in the environment? They're so excited. They want to see and touch and feel everything. This is my daughter, Zara. And we were bird watching at Hands Creek Beef Island. Look at her face. She's so happy to be on that beach. She has her binoculars, she's running, she's just loving it. And that's one thing I want to make sure that she always keeps. That love of the environment and that knowledge that the environment has a value in just existing. Not for what it can do for us, but just by being. Every person leaves a footprint. From every walk of life, in every industry, Imagine how much more we could do if we worked together. Thank you.